In today's episode, we're going to be talking to Betty Galligan, a local expert in PR and specifically PR crisis management, because it's not a matter of if a PR crisis will occur, it's a matter of when. So by the end of today's episode, you'll know the three most important things to remember when dealing with a PR crisis. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hi, and welcome to the Marketing Essentials Podcast. Our unique team helps small businesses grow by providing essential marketing expertise. Hello, and welcome to the Marketing Essentials Podcast. My name is Bill from W. Parmentier Photography. I'm Justin from Justin Kerr Design. And I'm Alicia with the Spark Social. And together we make up the Marketing, Marketing Essentials, Essentials Team. Alicia Sorry, for a second I, there. it's a Monday, Monday. So. <laughs> That's okay. It's all right. It's all right. We, people have heard it enough that I don't think it needs to be all three of us. But no, they're going to they're gonna write in. They're going to say, we did not hear Alicia on that intro. We missed Alicia. Anyway, I know. Sorry. Go ahead, Justin. I'll let you get, anyway, <laughs> get us started, will you? Today, today we're talking about PR uh, reputation management and crisis communication. And we are fortunate enough to have with us today Betty Galligan of Newberry PR and Marketing. Or did I get that backwards? Is it marketing and PR? No, you got it correct. Okay. PR and marketing. So <laughs> Betty is the founder and president of Newberry Public Relations and Marketing, which is located in East Providence. So, um, yes, you do have to go across a bridge if you want to visit Betty. Um, <laughs> she is accredited by the Public Relations Society of America and a member of its prestigious Counselors Academy. She has been doing this for 33 years and has experience in advertising, marketing, and PR, including crisis management, media relations, and strategy. But she's also... A rock star, and I mean that literally. Yeah. <laughs> Betty yes. is the lead singer of a band called Full Circle, and she has been in the rock scene for 33 years. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Wow. Nice. So it's we have literally a rock star with us, which is awesome. Well, so, we get to celebrate a new first. I like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we, we were talking a little bit before the episode uh, about all the things that you do and how... You know, these other things outside of the PR and the marketing that you do just sort of make you a complete... You know, person, it gives a full picture of what you do. I mean, you have some other hobbies as well. But, you know, knowing that you're a professional marketer and PR person, but that you're also a lead singer of a rock band just makes it very, very interesting, you know, and I think it lends a certain authenticity to it. Right. We were talking about authenticity and how important that is in business. And I love having my clients come to see my gigs. And sometimes I put prospects together, client prospects, or with their prospects together and invite them to the same gig and then see that happen. So business actually happens in bars. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Nice. Do you call them out like during your performance? Like, you I, over there by the I, bar. I you. sure do. <laughs> you need to get together. Welcome to so-and-so. <laughs> sometimes I have them try to come up and say something, but they, they get scared. Oh. <laughs> it's okay. Some of them actually came up and played. Really? They actually are wow. musicians, so I love when they come. Oh, that that's like awesome. Fun. Yeah, I always invite them to come up to the stage and perform whatever they want to do. I don't Very know cool. about the other guys in the band if they like it as much, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're the front person, it, you set the tone. That's right. Exactly. That you is set right. The tone. So that's awesome. So give us just a quick little synopsis of how you got into uh, marketing and then PR. Sure. Well, I went to Rhode Island College, and when I graduated from there, I got an internship. I got a I had internships, and I got a job right away in the Providence market, and really feel that I learned about what public relations is in college, in one of my classes. So I knew I fell in love with it then, and I was fortunate to form all my internships around that, and then get a job in the market nice. in 1986. All the way back. All then. the way back. Right. Oh my goodness! Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so things have changed in the PR world and the marketing world since you started. Absolutely. And when I first started, I started the company as Newberry PR, and a, a few years later added the and marketing because I realized the synergy between marketing and PR is so close. Mm -hmm. Because if I called up the Wall Street Journal and told them about one of my clients, the first thing they would do is what? Go to their website. 
Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. right. 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 True. So they need to have a marketing type of website. They, social media was not around then, and it was important for them to get a packet of information about about the company or client that I was promoting. And marketing really became an important integral part of public relations. And then that's how I built my business that way, more so on the PR blended with marketing. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So one of your expertise is expertise. I don't even expertise. Is that a word? (laughs) Expertise. (laughs) Expertise. Yeah. (laughs) One of the areas of expertise that you you have, yes. Um, I'm gonna get we're gonna get emails about that too. Well, you know. Um, hey, at least we get emails. <laughs> Look at it that way. Yeah. <laughs> is reputation management and crisis communication. Right. So is that something that like when you were in school and you were, you know, learning about PR, was that something that you're like, oh, I, I think I could be really good at this or something that you're particularly interested in, or did you just discover that this was something that you were good at once you started working in the in the field? I actually just discovered that I was good at it in the field. Because I don't think anyone wants to go into crisis communications because it's really scary. (laughs) And the textbook crises of the time in my day were the Tylenol crisis with Johnson & Johnson when they had the tainted Tylenol Mm -hmm. and had to remove them from the shelves. And then the Exxon Valdez was the other new textbook thing. And I'm sure there's so many today because social media just has brought crises to our forefront. But in the day, as I say... There um, were those types of crises that you would learn from, and then the way that you actually learn as a professional in PR, if you can do a crisis or not and handle one, is just by being thrown into one and getting the battle scars. Mm -hmm. Really is what it comes down to, is developing the battle scars over time, and then you realize, wow, I'm so level-headed during this crisis. I can really think clearly. I, I actually think because I had handicapped people in my family, for example, my grandmother had a stroke, and so she was paralyzed on one whole right side, and she lived with us, and she had a few TIAs, and I had to just take her to the hospital immediately, and and I always realized that I could handle, say, medical crises in my home growing up that formulated my ability to hi- to handle that later on in life. So it's kind of weird, but it's all a convolution of your whole life coming together into your career and what you bring to the table. So I think that really has helped a lot. Yeah, I can mm-hmm. see how that would, you know, mm-hmm. discovering that about yourself, it's like, hey, I'm, I'm not losing my mind here in this situation. <laughs> right, right. Like, Under you pressure. want me, you want me in a crisis. Yeah. You know, I'm really right. good in a crisis. I might break down later. <laughs> 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 but during a crisis, you would want me, I, if there was a hurricane going on, you know, you'd want me in the, in the storm with you. I was just going to say, that's rare. A lot of people with the pressure, they run the other direction. They run from the hurricane. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's part of just the high-pressure job of public relations in general, and also having pretty high-pressure bosses in the past that Mm. were really putting a lot of pressure on on Mm. Mm. me as an employee and being able to handle that as well. So it's just all the years of experience coming together into one. So do your clients kind of come, I don't know, if I don't want to go too far off track, but do your clients come to you before the crisis happens or while the crisis is happening? Do they put you on, you know, standby? How does that work? The great question, and it's all of the above. Okay. So sometimes I have the luxury of getting the call before or just as the crisis is occurring before the news media shows up. Mm-hmm. Other times the news media is right at their door and they're calling me. Oh, okay. And then other times we work really hard to prevent crises in the first place. And I love that part of it because we do scenario planning and we work out the crises before they actually happen. And then other times it's a little bit post-crisis where I have to do the cleanup. Mm, mm-hmm. Okay, so there's multiple scenarios. Multiple going on scenarios. Here. Yeah. So the, okay. the point would be if you're finding yourself as a business owner in a crisis mode or a crisis situation, to contact a professional as soon as possible. Okay. Now you said you do some uh, pre, you know, some planning ahead. Uh, and come up with scenarios. What what type of business would you be working with if they were coming to you ahead of time and saying, we need to come up with some scenarios here just in case it happens? Definitely construction in the past because there were a lot of construction accidents that can, can occur. And then healthcare and medical is another one where that could be something such as a death occurring or some sort of a scenario that relates to that. Restaurants, because there can all, when you're dealing with the public, it can be anything, but if you're dealing with food, sometimes food safety, 
okay. that sort of thing, retail. So it, I, really, it can be anything. You can sit down as your business right now. All three of you or anyone listening to this podcast can try to formulate what possible crisis could happen in my business that I would need to prepare for. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, in what I do, uh, I ended up taking insurance for errors and omissions because that can happen. You know, yes. and as careful as you can try to be, making sure that everything is supposed to be, you know, all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted, stuff can happen. Mm-hmm. And so having insurance for that was something that early on I said, I, I need to have this because it w- it's not if, it's when it happens. Right. Great um, point, yeah. too, about insurance because you can utilize your insurance policy to help pay for services like mine and, and your legal services that can come up from a crisis. So oh, that's some, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Wow, okay. Mm-hmm. Good to know. Good to know. So let's talk a little bit about once the you-know-what hits the fan, <laughs> <laughs> what are the things that any small business owner and entrepreneur needs to know in regards to other than calling you, <laughs> yes. how to handle this crisis. What are the three things you're going to tell them these are the most important things to keep in mind? Right, Actually, other than have me on speed dial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would be a crisis? You know, for I just want to kind of clarify because, you know, you I think some smaller businesses maybe think it has to be this large-scale catastrophe, like you said, Exxon, or the Tylenol situation, but what could be classified as a crisis for a local business? That is a great point, too. So I prepared a list because I thought about that thinking, (laughs) I always hate when I read books about big corporations and I can never put it down to what a small business would be in relative terms. So Mm -hmm. I wanted to make this clear that it's not the Exxon Valdez or the product recalls that are, you know, worldwide, but some of the list can be a price hike, Mm -hmm. a rate hike or a price hike Mm -hmm. that has come up, a product recall. Mm Mm-hmm. A data breach or a loss of some Ooh, sort of data a, at a some point. One now, yeah. mm-hmm. A supplier issue, that one's huge because it's out of your control, but you're the one hold, left holding the bag, but mm-hmm. it was a supplier. Especially with the holiday season coming up and orders being placed online and things like that. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Clo- being closed down by officials. Ooh, yeah. Oh, like mm-hmm. the health department? Yes, the health department okay. specifically. These are all things that I've had personal experience with, yeah. but these are some of the ones that come to mind when it can be a small business, not a large corporation. An accident or a death on your property. Ooh. Mm-hmm. A crazy person with a gun or starting a fire. Yeah. That has happened. Yikes. We're all making cringe faces right now. <laughs> yes. So these are the things that Betty has to deal with on a daily <laughs> basis. And our faces are just like so like, how do you do this? <laughs> crazy person with a crazy gun. Crazy person with a gun. <laughs> First yeah. thing is, mom, mom, put the gun down. Yes. Mom, put it down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know I'm sending this to your mom now. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> if you know my mom, she would be the last person to yeah, do that. Talking, but yeah. <laughs> I know. And one of the last ones is an employee being arrested or accused of something egregious outside of the business or maybe even within your company, like embezzlement, Mm -hmm. but also it could be something that they did on their own personal time, but it's affecting your business. And with social media now, you can see where people work, everybody is related, and it doesn't take long to be like, hey, this employee who was in my home doing construction work is now... On the you know Providence mm-hmm. Journal police blotter for robbery. <laughs> yes, ah. or go local prov or someone else <laughs> yeah, breaking somebody. that news. Yeah. Mm. And there it is, and you have to deal with it. Now, yeah. mm-hmm. I got a question for you um, along that line. Someone, uh, a local restaurant to us, actually an ice cream place, recently got closed down for three or four days because of the health, health department. And surprisingly, it wasn't the local news that, that busted, busted it wide open or even um, like Go Local Providence or anything like that, but it was actually a Facebook group. Mm-hmm. So what happens in that type of situation? And what would you do as far as helping to kind of minimize that? Because it literally got all over the, the town Facebook page talking about why this business was closed down for three days. Oh, yes. So Facebook is the new journalism. Yes. yes. Our social media is definitely the number one media that you need to be aware of, monitoring on a regular basis, mm-hmm. and then acting on Facebook, or I'll, we'll just use Facebook for sure. now, but yeah. say in that case, that breaking there, mm-hmm. and then 
what you would want to do, you would want to act very quickly, Mm -hmm. you would want to act very transparently, and then you would want to act with compassion. Those are the three main things that someone should be considering when dealing with a a PR crisis. I think the company, the restaurant came back on that same group later, uh, originally came on and said, "We're we're closed for maintenance. And then uh, somebody uh, got word that it was a health department that's issue. That's not transparent. That, that was is not transparent. Not transparent. Matter of fact, I've driven by the place a few times since they've reopened, and you can definitely tell the amount of people that normally go to that place has dwindled yes. quite a bit. The big question is: Have you gone back to that place? No, no. <laughs> I, yeah. I, we we don't frequent the place that often, but mm-hmm. uh, it's definitely given me pause to think. Oh, I don't know if I want to go back there now. Know. Know. Because what just happened there is the trust was eroded. Exactly. And that's what happens with a PR crisis, and that's what you want to work to minimize or avoid. Mm-hmm. And you can avoid that by being completely transparent, sure. right? If, if they were honest about it and said, hey, look, we had some issues that we were trying to clean up, we're complying with everything, which they eventually did do like a week after the fact. Mm, but too late they, then. At that point, it's too late. Yeah. Too but late. if they had come out and said, hey, look, we're working on these issues, we're taking care of they were brought to our attention, we took care of them immediately, mm-hmm. I probably would have been more likely to go, okay, I'll go back. Right, But right. when you initially try to lie like it's not actually happening. Yes. Mm, you kind of lost me at that good, point. Yeah. Yeah. So the so. transparency leads into the uh, the compassion part because sure. if you're transparent and honest and then you're, you the compassion part I'm talking about is if you think about what a customer would really want to know about this. Mm-hmm. In order to continue the trust there and come back and feel safe coming back, mm-hmm. but that shows that you as a company or the ice cream company would have compassion for its own Sure. It was own customers. If you're dismissing it like, oh, trying to hide it like it was a maintenance issue, and then trying to live behind that and lead behind that, it's really not going to go resonate up, yeah. and go, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, you and I were talking earlier about uh, that issue of transparency, and you mentioned a story to me about uh, Comic Con. Yes. The one in Providence, or the one in Providence? Really? Yes, I, yes. I haven't heard the story. So yeah. Okay. Well, the story goes like this. <laughs> <laughs> Back in 2014, I got the phone call. It happened on a Saturday, but I got the call on a Sunday, and so this would have been an example of it being after the fact when after the crisis really hit. But there was overcrowding, oh, okay. and it was very serious overcrowding. And what happened was people were being turned away. People had been passing out because it got hot in there. Families were torn away from their own kids because they the parents got shoved out the door but the kids were still inside or maybe you were there with your friends but you got split up and then you had to all get stuck outside mm-hmm. while your friend was inside with the keys to Ooh. your car mm-hmm. you know yeah. and so there were a lot of issues flying around and it was all due to overcrowding due to the tremendous success of that particular mm-hmm. comic con that year so as a victim of its own success and sure. that's another example of how a PR crisis could happen, right? Yeah, you would never think it would happen that way. It's like, hey, right. we're doing so well. Uh-oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened was, after the fact, Facebook went crazy, right? Mm-hmm. All of the stories and the negativity came out on Facebook, and it was just negative, 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 which actually brought down the person at Comic-Con who was in charge of handling the social media. So she became overwhelmed and really needed help. She, she really needed my help. And I was happy to, to give that help because I needed her to remove herself from the negative part being swirled and being caught up into that. I, as a third-party outside person, can come in and, and be the voice of Rhode Island Comic Con on Facebook. And mm-hmm. that's what I had to do. So th- that brings up a good question. Mm-hmm. Um, is, do you find that you have to pull them away from that negative part? Because as a business owner, you, you kind of want to protect yourself and you want to say, well, no, that's wrong and this is wrong. And you get so embroiled in the arguments with people over what misinformation you think may be out there Mm -hmm. that you miss the whole bigger picture. Right. Sometimes you have to decide, which would be my job, who is the best person to be the spokesperson at this time. Gotcha. Sometimes it needs to be the CEO and the owner. Mm -hmm. Definitely. It can't be anybody else because then it just looks like someone's hiding behind a PR person. And then that doesn't give the transparency. Mm -hmm. But other times you want to help the person because they're just so emotionally caught up into it that they're very passionate and that can come out, but at times you want to remove them from something like this where behind the scenes it was okay for me to be the the voice on the fingers of the keyboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And really what that became was customer service, customer service all day long, working with what I would call operations there. So I had to be very accessible to the operations people because what was happening, people had purchased, say, a package of the William Shatner package and they were expecting to get their photo taken with him or they ordered some sort of thing and they were supposed to get something in the mail 
and time and time and time had gone by months after the event and they still hadn't gotten theirs. And then they, you know, if you well, give them an inch, someone's going to take a yard with sure. crisis, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. one little thing goes wrong, then everything they're seeing is wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Everything about that Comic Con they were seeing as wrong instead of a lot of the positives. Now, what we did was we were able to turn it around. And if you can utilize and harness your, not the detractors on social media, but the fans on social media, and do that transparency, be honest with them, and really tell them the truth of what's happening, then they start to fight your fight on social media. Mm-hmm. It's just like what happens yeah. in person. So if I'm sure. ha- we're all at a party right now, and you're getting really negative, but we're all staying positive, we might look at you and give you the hairy eye, <laughs> yeah. or yeah. Alicia might look at you and say, will you just knock it off? Or Shut up, William. <laughs> Justin might say something to you. <laughs> and that's exactly what is duplicated on social media. Real life happens on social media, and that's what ends up happening in a crisis situation. So that's how we turned around the Comic-Con to that and was, were able to fulfill all of the operations issues, talk to them, be really honest about we were not ready for this success, basically coming out with a real message that said we're a victim of our own success, and here's how you can help us. Do you have any ideas? So what we can do that's better a great next way to year. Think about it, you know? right? Yeah, I was just about to ask that. How, how did? What was your role in helping them plan for the the next year? It was definitely strategic, and that's why I feel if you can hire a professional in a crisis, because strategy really plays a huge role in your crisis, from timing to who talks to what message should we be putting out there? What is our main message point? And that's really the most important thing is to have that strategy. So in this case, obviously you were talking about something that was successful that just went wrong because it was so successful. Now what happened, how do you turn around a true negative where, where it, it, somebody dies or like you're talking about somebody dies on the property or something or somebody comes in with a gun? How do you spin that to, to try to get it so that way it's not as bad as it, as it initially came up as. Really, what it really comes down to, I'm going to tell you, the easiest thing in the whole world that people find so hard to do is to issue an apology. Wow, yeah. That is the main thing to diffuse a situation and maybe turn an angry mob more in your favor. Hmm. And it's is, it, simple- is it hard because of pride or shame or what, why is it hard for that it's, to it's, happen it's both it's both and, and more because it also gets into some legal issues where you really can't come out right away and say something it, about fault, yeah. right who's at fault or oh. who's guilty or sorry is it is sometimes considered an acknowledgement of guilt in court i guess or how is that the it, how you say it yeah. would be how you work with that in an admission of yeah. court right okay. so if you if you say i'm so sorry for what happened as opposed to I'm so sorry for, or I'm so sorry for your experience Mm -hmm. and not I'm so sorry because we were really negligent in putting that puddle right there and leaving the puddle there that you slipped on it. Or we should have had more security. We should have had more security if we had only done this. You know, you don't want to get into that kind of a discussion, but you definitely want to apologize for what the person experienced. It's very similar to customer service. Gotcha. Customer service. Mm -hmm. That that makes complete sense. I think I'm thinking of like an episode of Parks and Rec where somebody uh, got hurt and they couldn't say sorry and the lawyer was following her around and saying, you can't say this, you can't do this, you can't give them an apology card because that's going to put us in a legal perspective where we're liable or something like that. So yes. it's just, that was a comedy, obviously, but it, it shed light like on what you're saying. In real life, mm-hmm. we do have to work with lawyers. Mm-hmm. And what works well is when the lawyer understands PR's role. Mm-hmm. And when they don't understand the role, they try to tell their clients to say no comment. They would advise them to say no comment. You never, ever, ever in your life really want to say that. Okay. Because the media will find someone else to comment and it's not going to be you <laughs> directing the news. It's going to be someone else. And then you so lose now, control at that point, right? Yeah. And you lose complete control. Right. Right. I like that approach yes. very much so. Yes. So you want to proactively Make a comment. You want to make it a comment that at least covers a lot of things but doesn't get you into legal hot water. So the crafting of that message is so, so important. Mm -hmm. Mm. I had a client that was a franchise of a a large uh, pizza chain. And their employee, uh, one of their franchisees, was accused of sexual misconduct with young ladies that worked for him. And so the strategy there was very important because I also found out in my accessibility and research 
which we have to do very quickly, that he also was a school teacher of an all-girls school and was a swim coach Whoa. of a girls' swim team. So I knew aye, that the aye. story was going to go that way. Ooh. Who's caring that a, a pizza guy making pizza is doing this? But they're going to care that a school, school teacher, teacher with mm-hmm. a swim coach yeah. is mm-hmm. accused of doing this. Now, we were really careful to make our statement. I timed it just so. So I did not get on the 6 o'clock news. We wanted to do the 10 and 11 o'clock. Let this kind of drag out a little bit to see the, the coverage here. But we were very uh, we were complying with the news media. We made a statement. And it did get published at, at at the news and on in the newspaper, but we were very careful not to accuse that gentleman of doing anything. And come to find out, those girls were lying. Ooh, and unfortunately, worse. he lost his job, but he kept his business. And he's he still he went to work every day because he was not guilty, but it, business was going down, and the franchisor was nervous about the brand sure, reputation sure. Mm-hmm. and. Our statement did not throw him under the bus at all, mm-hmm. and we're glad that we did not do that because, come to find out, it, it was untrue. Was I think I remember true. that story. I remember hearing something about that story. Mm-hmm. Wow, it's mm-hmm. a shame. So, knowing when to say when, when to put something out, having the timing, and do you hide the crisis or you not hide the crisis? You know, I mean, sometimes you can't hide it in front of your own customers. Sure. but right. do you want to actually take it to the news media as the other? Is the other so, issue? Well, you had mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry, mm-hmm. Bill. Uh, uh-huh. I actually was just going to ask a question to follow up on the timing part of it. Is it advantageous to you to sometimes hide it a little bit by waiting off a little bit to give it to the media? You know, Absolutely. Like, like you said, I, I think that I heard something one time, and I don't know if this is true, you can correct me on this. A lot of times politicians will release statements on the weekend because they figure by the time the news cycle comes back around on Monday, it's already forgotten. Mm. Yes, well, we don't. We never play games with any of that. Yeah, I, would no, say, no, I would call fair, it that fair way. Enough. Fair um, enough. Yeah. Yes, yes. But we, but I would call that maybe more manipulation than needed. Yeah. We take the, the I guess, responsibility of answering to the journalists and the news gotcha. media. And that's, our, I mean, of course, we want to make sure our client is positioned in the best possible light. Mm-hmm. But our real goal is to work with the news media. Oh, okay. That's exactly okay. what we, and if this was going to the news, obviously, if it wasn't, if it was just being kept to customers, Mm-hmm. which can be handled by a letter, for example, or an mm-hmm. email, mm-hmm. right, or a Facebook message or a, put something on your website. It doesn't always have to rise to the level of the occasion of putting it into a news release and making a big news press conference out of it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So crises can take different, differing levels. But in the case where we're working with the news media, our job is to get them news and the right information that they need. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. And so we would never... We would never probably manipulate it to say, hey, no, I, I, I don't, don't, maybe Saturday, that was a poor, right? that was probably a poor example, but no, I'm just saying as far as... it's a good example. I think it's a really good example. <laughs> of what not to do. Of what right? not to do. I would, I would say in that case, because then what relationship, what media relationship are you having with the news media? Sure, sure. And that's that's what we want to have forever, is the relationship with the news media. Sure. And because you got to go back to them at other points with exactly. other clients. So, gotcha. so what about our own credibility, right? Mm-hmm. So we, we don't do that. Mm-hmm. So we've... We've covered, you know, acting quickly, you know, and timing is important. And you talked a little bit about being transparent with uh, Comic-Con. But you also mentioned acting with compassion. And I'd like to kind of end on that because I think that surprised me only because, like you said, it's hard sometimes for folks to say, I made a mistake or I'm sorry. And the compassion thing, I think, plays right into that. That's got to be difficult, too, because it's not, I don't think it's a default mode for a lot of business owners, sure. you know? And right. so how does that play out? How does that acting com- with compassion play out? Well, the first thing that you need to do is to acknowledge whatever mistake or error or situation has happened. And you need to also list out who w- is caring about this. So in the, there was an example where someone passed away on my client's property by an accident. We found out that the person who was responsible for the accident was so young, so our compassionate statement was, you know, you can imagine how it's unimaginable for this person and her family to be dealing with this at this very difficult time. And then we also tried to reach out to, obviously, the members of that person's family of the deceased. We also knew that there were a lot of bystanders that witnessed this, so the compassion to acknowledge their issues. We brought in clergy to help them with their issues, to talk to employees, to talk to anyone who would like to speak about this. 
that's what I'm saying about the compassion part is try to help people work through this trauma, if you will. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the trauma doesn't have to be as rising to the level of a death, but it could be something pretty traumatic of a loss of an employee or some kind of an issue where people feel hurt. There's some sort of feelings and emotion and you have to acknowledge that emotion. I also feel with compassion that this is your opportunity sometimes in a crisis to make a positive. And what this would do is to, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is what values does the company stand for and how can you convey that to someone? Can you convey that your company has a heart? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Right? Excellent. Remove the products from the shelves because you don't want anyone else to get sick or die. You know, can you do something to convey that you stand for this and you're not going to stand for that bad behavior? Mm-hmm. This is your opportunity to really show your... Co- I say crises help companies show their true colors. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, it's right? very relational. Mm-hmm. I, I would think when in a situation like you mentioned, the people involved want to know that somebody cares. They want to know that the company or organization cares about them as people. And I think if you can do that through what you do in, in crisis management and PR, I think that goes a long way to, as you said, eventually turning that into a positive. Right. You know? Out of every crisis comes something positive. Sometimes it's a new policy, a new procedure, a new way of doing something. It's the battle scar that I, we talked about in the beginning of the podcast where you almost have to have something like that happen, unfortunately, in order to grow or move forward or move on in a way that makes the most sense. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So, yeah. again, three things to remember. Act quickly, be transparent, and act with compassion. I think those are excellent points. Now, uh, we talked before about having you on speed dial. So if someone wanted to get a hold of you, Betty, how, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure. My office phone is the best way because I can also get that to my cell phone. So my office phone is 401-433-5965. And my email address is Betty, B-E-T-T-Y, at NewberryPR.com. That's N-E-W-B-E-R-R-Y-P-R.com. Okay. Nice. Well, we'll make sure to put all those in the show notes. Absolutely. And if somebody wanted to find out um, about, about band? your band, yeah. Full Circle, how do they do that? <laughs> well, oh, we do we, have a we, Facebook. We See me on Facebook. <laughs> okay. Our guitarist runs the Facebook page. So you can find on my Facebook page, you can give me a friend request, and then you can I put everything up there when we're playing out. We play out every weekend. Wow. Awesome. Just, wow. just about every weekend, yes. Wow. Yep. Nice. So you can always catch Full Circle at local <laughs> venues near you. <laughs> okay. awesome. Awesome. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for yes, coming in today. And thank you for having me. Had fun. Yeah, it was really it was, fun. This Great was conversation. Great. Yeah. Very informative. Okay. Well, with that, <clears throat> excuse me, wow. All of a sudden, I'm you're having, all choked I'm up. Having problems Bill's talking all choked all of a sudden. Wow. He, we talked about compassion and being transparent, <laughs> and Bill's just falling right apart. <laughs> so thanks for joining us today on the podcast. And until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you for joining us today, and as always, you can find the back episodes of our podcast on Apple Podcasts, and you can also find us on our YouTube channel. Both of them are the Marketing Essentials Team. You can find us on the web at marketingessentialsteam.com, and if you subscribe through our website, you'll receive a weekly email and letting you know when each episode has been published. Also, you'll receive a link to subscriber-only content. You can also find us on Facebook and our private Facebook group. Just search Little Roadie Marketing Support Group. It's a great place for other marketing professionals and business owners where we can share marketing advice, challenges, and general trends. Hope to see you there.